uh, Senator Kinkley's. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, as I look down my list of questions, I'm going to give you a lot of assignments, I realized. Um, the first is on availability. Uh, you and I have talked about this. Uh, the, the range of availability for Air Force uh, airplanes is in the 60s, generally. Perhaps some are below, maybe one or two are above. That's unacceptable. And uh, these are expensive platforms. In the private sector, you would never have a $100 million item that's only available 60% of the time. I hope that you would do a study, order a study, of availability and readiness and what the bottlenecks are. And is it parts? Is it maintainers? Is it uh, w w what are what what is causing us to have to have so many planes stranded for such long periods of time? Would you commit to taking a very serious look at this question, Senator? Absolutely, will. I, I would say if I could just make a point on that. It, it is true that these these availability numbers need to come up. We are starting that. I can definitely report back to you on what we're doing and how we're doing. I think one of the challenges is we don't control all the levers that commercial industry was doing. I think we mentioned, you know, we, we would love to be able to benchmark ourselves by Delta, but Delta would never keep airplanes for as long as we keep airplanes. And so, so those are some of the things that we're trying to be able to, uh, to manage, but I, I will be happy, Senator, to get back to you. Well, one part of this, it seems to me, is 3D printing and getting to the point where when we buy a platform, we also buy the IP so that we can print our own parts when necessary. Senator, that was, again, that was a great conversation we had in your office, and I agree with that. And it's not only just in uh, 3D printing some parts, and we talked about the, the airworthiness is, it, it's not the, it's a subset. But we have to it's work with the FAA to be sure we can get them certified. A absolutely, but this, this idea of additive manufacturing is not only in our aircraft, it's in the way that we deploy. We need to think about how we travel lighter. And so those sort of things, the, the advent of ad additive manufacturing is not only just to increase the reliability of our weapon systems, but it's also to increase our lethality and performance in, in combat. Agreed. I want to associate my comments also with my co-chair of Strategic Forces, Senator Fisher, with regard to the Sentinel program, one of the largest projects ever undertaken by the United States government. Uh, again, a second assignment. Keep an eye on it. Keep a close eye on it because uh, both in terms of cost, timeliness, it's a critical part of our triad, and yet uh, it is a very complex project. So I hope that this is going to get the attention it, it must have uh, in order to be on time and within budget. Senator, you have my commitment on it. Future conflict is going to involve an immense challenge of logistics, uh, particularly if we're talking about the Pacific. And uh, I, I think, I hope that there's thought going on in the Air Force about what future conflict looks like. It's not going to be like it was 10, 20, or 50 years ago. It's going to be a very different conflict and logistics, particularly fuel, is going to be a major challenge. Do you see that as, as, as part of the war planning for any future conflict? Senator, I do, and, and to your point, the future conflict is gonna happen at such a speed and scale and pace that whoever gets choked up on logistics first, that could be, that could be the critical difference maker. Well, that's, <laughs> that, that was gonna be my next point. The first thing that's gonna go is GPS and uh, all of the electronic systems that we've come to depend upon. And uh, we, would, we have all these very sophisticated platforms, but uh, many of them depend upon things like GPS or alternatives. So I, I hope that there are, uh, I, I've pushed the Navy on teaching people at Annapolis how to use a sextant. I don't know if you can do that in a jet aircraft, but there has to be some thought given to the fact that electronic warfare is going to be the first phase of any conflict. The first thing that's going to happen is we're going to be blinded. Senator, I think that's a, a realistic expectation. And as we look at, uh, through our s and portfolio, we look at things like alternate position navigation and timing. Those are things that we're investigating as well as I would uh, lean to my brothers and sisters in the Space Force in, in building the resiliency to be able to ensure that we don't have that uh, as uh, much of a, a critical Achilles heel, uh, but your point is well taken in that understanding that the, the first shot may actually happen non-kinetically or in space, and we need to be able to adapt and respond to that. I would say yes. not may. I would say almost certainly. And the final piece of it, of course, is communications and command and control. Again, 
uh, command and control is going to be essential, and we have to that that's got to be as we upgrade the triad, command and control. I I view it as a quad actually. That command and control is part of the triad. Senator, I, I agree with you, and I think that's why when we talk about the triad, we, we talk about the Air Force has two-thirds of the triad plus three-quarters of the NC-3, understanding that all those four elements, you, you don't have effective strategic deterrence without those. Thank you. Thank you, General. Congratulations, and I look forward to hopefully a timely confirmation. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator King. Senator Scott, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, General, thanks for being here. Congratulations on uh, your unbelievable service. You're clearly qualified to, to do this, uh, the next job. So I look forward to working with you. The first, I just want to bring up something that, uh, just to repeat, we, and thanks for coming by my office, but um, when um, the Air Force decided to move 623 service members out of uh, the, our panhandle without calling us and telling us anything about it, um, um, concerned me. Um, I think probably any governor did what we did in Florida, is we put a lot of effort when I was governor to make sure that we were BRAC safe and we put a lot of effort in making sure we were the place where people wanted to fulfill their mission and the military could do their mission. And so I just want to tell you, I was disappointed that the secretary wouldn't call back and explain why he moved. There might be a lot of legitimate reasons for it, but not call in to tell us why. It didn't make any sense to me. Um, first, a couple of questions. Next, Homestead. We talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, it's... it's um, it's, uh, I think, the, the closest uh, air base to Latin America, and it's a way to project power to Latin America. It's important to the, our, uh, the community of Homestead um, Air Force Base. And uh, when General Brown was um, testifying, he, he said that, um, you know, he believes that, um, quote, still has a, Homestead still has a mission and will still have a platform to operate from there. So can you talk about what you believe is going to happen with Homestead over the next five years? Well, Senator, as we look at um, our future modernization plans and how that plays out, uh, I would say that as each individual installation, I cannot give you a firm answer as to what will or will not happen, but as we discussed in your office, we certainly we look to those who have missions to continue with those missions. And what I can, if I'm confirmed, what I can commit to is continued dialogue uh, early on in that process. Thank you. Next, uh, we talked about this, uh, Hurricane Nadalia. The Air Force missed about six hours of a mission to provide data to the National Hurricane Center, um, which for a state that has, at least right now, seems like we have a lot of hurricanes, uh, doing that was, was a significant problem. So can you talk about what happened and what you'll do to make sure that, um, you know, the National Hurricane Center gets the services they need? Uh, yes, Senator, and, and, and again, I would like to say that, you know, hats off to the recovery for effort that was there and uh, you know the, feel terrible about the damage that was caused by Adelia but Florida has certainly proved to be resilient through hurricanes with respect to the the hurricane hunter mission uh, I will say that uh, as usual during hurricane season they are very very closely as, uh, associated and and in conversation with NOAA and they position themselves in a place where they see as the largest threat, if you will, uh, of the hurricane. And so they were dispersed in uh, places like St. Croix where there was also some, a storm brewing. And as uh, the situation changed, they did reprioritize and put more assets in backup. In that interim time, we still had the platform available. Unfortunately, there was a maintenance delay with that. And so there, that's why they, the potential gap. But by the time it became a, um, a cat two, we already had the, the the forces from St. Croix redeployed and ready to support Nadelia. And I would say I shouldn't get off the stage with, with just congratulating what those hurricane hunters do, much like the folks who do the mass firefighting. That's dangerous business, and oh, yeah. they do it every summer. Yeah, I don't think I would want to be up there, so, <laughs> what they do. Um, the uh, next, the Air Force activated the 350th Spectrum Warfare Wing at Eglin on June 25th, 2021, to support the consolidation and modernization of the Department of the Air Force Electromagnetic Spectrum Enterprise. Can you talk about the importance of this and how do you see um, what the Air Force's role is going to be going forward with, with regard to this? Yeah, Senator, thank you. We've, we've been talking here in, in, in bits and pieces here about uh, electromagnetic warfare and uh, spectrum and maintaining the spectrum. This is something that uh, we're understanding. It's, it's evolving from something we used to think about as spectrum management, which was when you operate in different frequencies here. We're finding this is much more integrated into the way of war. And the idea of a spectrum warfare wing that understands not only 
how we operate within the spectrum, but what our vulnerabilities might be, what the adversary's vulnerabilities might be. And this spectrum warfare is really integrating with the other traditional uh, parts of warfare and ensuring that we can uh, have our air superiority, we can support our strike missions, all those by, by not just managing spectrum, but protecting our own vulnerabilities and exploiting those of our adversaries. And I think that's the exciting part. Uh, and I, I see this as an expanding mission because it is gonna be part and parcel to the future of warfare. And if we're gonna try and prosecute that many targets at that amount of time, we have to be able to dominate spectrum. And I'm really excited about what the folks are doing down at the 350th. Thanks for your service and congratulations on your nomination. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Scott, Senator Peters, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Alvin, uh, it's good to uh, see you again and uh, congratulations uh, to both you and your family uh, for uh, this nomination to become our, our next uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Um, I just want to uh, first to just quickly acknowledge something that you and I discussed uh, in my office uh, earlier, and that is uh, recent steps uh, by the Air Force to install treatment systems uh, in Michigan, uh, which is uh, a welcome and certainly a, uh, the right direction to address the PFAS uh, contamination uh, we have in our state. So again, I'm, I'm pleased uh, with the uh, initial action that's being taken. However, I also want to stress, as I stressed with you uh, at length, uh, we don't need to go over it again, but uh, at length that there's still more work to be done to uh, expedite uh, these uh, cleanup efforts. And I'm gonna continue to hold the Air Force and other federal agencies accountable for protecting public health in Michigan, and as well as ensuring that uh, Michigan's defense installations, particularly Southridge uh, Air National Guard Base, uh, remain central to our national defense and long-term uh, strategic goals uh, as well, and look forward to, if confirmed, future conversations uh, related to that. But my question for you, uh, General Alvin, is that during our visit, we briefly discussed innovation and opportunities for the Air Force to expand and speed up autonomy development for the uh, next generation uh, air dominance platform, as well as the uh, collaborative uh, combat aircraft. And given your comments and concerns uh, for ensuring the Air Force uh, can outmatch uh, and outpace our adversaries, my question is, if confirmed, would you recommend additional testing and training sites where the Air Force can test integrate and validate autonomous mobility for next generation platforms. And I'm asking uh, this question uh, because given the CCAs uh, will be an, uh, an autonomous platform, uh, to me it seems to open up the possibility for changes in the standard Air Force uh, operational test and evaluation doctrine. If you could speak to that, please. Yeah, Senator, and thank you for that uh, question because uh, uh, as I look forward, I really do believe that central to our success as an Air Force and quite frankly as a joint force, I believe will be our ability to tackle and, and really leverage autonomy and AI in, in the battle space in a responsible manner. We're starting down that path and associated with that, to your point, uh, operational test and training infrastructure is gonna be key. As we evaluate what will be required and what the, the uh, systems and the associated ranges and airspace that will be required, uh, we need to look at those that are not just perhaps in, in the traditional uh, testing ranges, but I can see opportunities for more in the synthetic environment or perhaps more in the actual environment in different ranges. So while not uh, wanting to commit to a certain thing, I believe that that is gonna be part and parcel in our transformation of understanding how one can move uh, uncrewed aircraft in a different airspace in a different environment. Well, thank you for that and uh, look forward to working with you on that. And, and in the spirit uh, of innovation, uh, partnership and collaboration, I wanna highlight a recent conversation that I had with Assistant Secretary uh, Chaudhry, who recently attended Exercise uh, Northern Strike in, in Michigan. Uh, the Assistant Secretary seemed uh, particularly uh, impressed with uh, the Michigan uh, Guard's ability to host and, and lead a, it's a multinational, uh, multi-component joint force training exercise using assets like the Selfridge Air National Guard Base, as well as Camp Grayling and uh, basically the vast uh, physical space and spectrum that's available uh, in northern Michigan. So my question for you, sir, is, uh, is if confirmed, how would you resource and budget for joint force exercises like Northern Strike that can provide invaluable opportunities for airmen to train with the, not only the joint force, but uh, with our foreign partners as well? Well, Senator, first I would say that uh, I'd like to add my congratulations for how successful Northern Strike continues to be, because this isn't the first year, obviously it's been very successful over the years, continues to grow. And as we continue to look at different ways of, of supporting the joint warfighting concept, I can see these particular exercises being particularly useful. 
Uh, I also want to congratulate the Air National Guard for how they do, they sort of host all of this and bring it all together from a joint perspective, which shows that, again, we are a total force, Air Force and a total force joint force. Uh, if confirmed, I will continue to advocate for these types of exercises that can advance on our joint warfighting concept. Uh, the Joint Staff J-7 also is one of those elements that has uh, looks over their joint training exercise program. So if confirmed as a, a member of the Joint Chiefs, I will also look to work with them to ensure that our joint training exercise program uh, leverages all of the capabilities and all of the competencies for things like Northern Strike to be integrated into our exercising and, and uh, training going forward. Great. Well, thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Peters. Senator Schmidt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for being here, General. Um, and uh, thank you for your service. Uh, to our country. Um, I'm going to start by just noting I have serious concerns about our military remaining neutral in the political sphere. Uh, if confirmed, you have a duty not only to protect the country but also to protect the reputation of the military by your words and actions, of course. Previous actions and comments by some in our military command have thrust our military into political issues that are both distracting and inappropriate. Um, as we get increasingly concerning reporting about China's military growth and ambitions, I fear that the People's Republic of China uh, poses a threat to our country like none other we've had in our history, uh, both militarily, economically, in their designs. A potential conflict with China would necessarily rely heavily on the Air Force, and our preparedness for such a scenario is my chief concern. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Uh, General Alvin, your nomination comes at a time when the threat posed by Communist China has reached critical levels. It also comes at a time when the Air Force is at a crossroads for decommissioning old platforms while also investing in future platforms like the B-21, which is critical in deterring uh, PRC aggression. I look forward to hearing more about the direction you envision for the Air Force and how those uh, decisions we're making today will strengthen uh, deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. The first thing I want to touch on is um, during the August recess, had a chance to get to Whiteman, uh, which we're very proud of in Missouri, of course. And we look forward to those B-21s um, making their way there. But there's also um, the 442nd fighter wing is there. And I know this is not a new issue, but I do want to hear uh, from you. There's a lot of trained people there that have worked on the A-10 over the years. Um, what, when do you think the airport, Air Force will finalize um, some of the transition plans? for the A-10, um, like at the 442nd, how do you, where do you see this moving? Because obviously, uh, once you lose kind of a trained workforce, it's very hard to bring that back. And I know that that follow-on mission is really important. What are your thoughts on that? Well, thank you for that, Senator. And, and of course, Whiteman is, it's a, it's a crown jewel. Um, and I, I think the people around Whiteman have gotten used to seeing interesting looking platforms flying around and being impressed by them. And so I'm sure the B-21 will not disappoint. Uh, to your point about the 442nd, Senator, I think uh, it, you know, has the distinction of, of really serving well with the A-10, and we know that that is a, that is a platform that does not necessarily find its, its place in the future with, with the fight with, with China. As we look towards working with uh, the Reserve Command and how we can leverage not only perhaps an association on the B-21, but for future missions, in any of these, the first thing that we want to do is see if we can, if there is an appropriate flying mission. If there's not an appropriate flying mission, we at least want a continuing mission. So as we go forward, I believe the, uh, um, the uh, A-10 divestment in Whiteman isn't until later in the fight up, but we will, I, I commit to you if I'm confirmed, we will be in dialogue about opportunities and the pathway that we're doing, that we're approaching, looking at the total force lay down as we're looking at a force design, which is potentially going to have a larger overall Air Force footprint, but how we can ensure that that total force, to your point, Senator, that the great skills and capabilities that are resident in those maintainers and flyers are not lost uh, as we have this very critical time in the fight with China. Well, and as you know, they're, in just talking with them, the longer, um, and I'm preaching the choir here, but I think it's important to note, the longer that goes on, you know, people make decisions um, in the reserve of where they go, and and uh, so I think it's important, obviously, to kind of move that along just for some certainty. Um, but as I, I do want to, I, I have to ask you, I touched on this during my opening remarks, I have, um, which is not news um, here today, but serious concerns about um, injecting politics into our military. I think it's incredibly divisive, there's no place in it, um, and I don't, I'm not a spouse, and I don't want one particular ideology to take hold. I just, I just feel like the military is there to be a, a lethal fighting force that needs to be prepared. And so some of the things we've seen over the last 
couple years um, are concerning. And the Air Force in particular, some of the top brass have, have waded into this uh, headlong. Uh, General Alvin, you are not a signatory to this, but I do want to ask you, last year, um, uh, General Brown uh, was a signatory to a memo that advocated for racial quotas for Air Force officers. Can you share your thoughts with that August memo? Senator, I will. I'll share my thoughts. Uh, my thoughts are that um, our focus has always been about fielding the best, most capable, most lethal Air Force. And my understanding of that memo was that it was designed to reach further out into uh, the, the corners of the country to find the best available talent. But we are a meritocracy, and we are one that's focused on lethality and readiness. And to the point you made earlier in your statement, Senator, which couldn't be more correct, is that we have a growing threat. And we have to focus and we have to maintain our readiness and our focus on a sense of urgency on being able to meet that. And so it is and will be, if confirmed, my continued focus is ensuring the readiness and the lethality of this force to meet the threat and making sure our airmen stay focused on that as well. Thank you. And I, and I share your desire to, to reach out to as many people as possible. Um, and I haven't heard anything from your testimony that you'd be advocating for, for racial quotas. Again, I think this is a, this is a poison. Uh, writ large, but certainly in our military, so I, I appreciate your answer. But, Senator, I, I will not, and if confirmed, I do not intend to at all ever advocate for racial quotas. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, General Alvin, uh, great seeing you again. Enjoyed our conversation uh, last week, and congratulations on your nomination. Uh, thrilled that in July, the Air Force announced that Davis Mothin has been selected as the preferred location for the Air Force Special Operations Power Projection Wing. And this is a critical step in the Air Force basing process and represents a formal decision by the Secretary to advance the transition plan on this. And this important decision allows the Air Force to modernize to meet the pacing threat from China while still retaining critical capabilities and the flexibility that's necessary to engage any threat, anywhere, anytime. And there are a series of other actions, including fleet modernization and new assets coming to Davis Mothin as part of this transition. So General, do, do I have your commitment to closely monitor this transition and the activities around it at DM to ensure that in each step in the process that it occurs in a timely manner without and without delay. Senator, you absolutely have my commitment on that. If thank confirmed. you. Thank you. And, and, and if you do wind up encountering any delays or ident identify any need for additional resources, I ask that you come to, uh, to me uh, and this committee right away. So do I have your commitment to stay in close communication with me and um, with the rest of the Arizona delegation in particular on the status of these activities? Senator, you do. Thank you. Thank you, General. And General, um, an area that I am very interested in and that's very important to our national defense is electronic warfare. Uh, when I flew in the you know, first Gulf War, you know, our ability to get ahead uh, of our enemy in the uh, EW spectrum was critical to our success in the air war in particular. Um, and I believe that the Defense Department needs to focus its efforts on electronic warfare. Um, because now, even more, than, more so than in 1991, you know, that's where the next war is likely to begin. And you know, for many years, you know, we looked at air superiority with electronic warfare support as being central you know, to the way that we you know, we fight and win a war, but I think in the future, you know, the, the electronic warfare superiority is gonna be, you know, more critical than ever. And so I worked on some language that's now in the def defense bill to direct the Joint Chiefs and the Undersecretary for Research and Engineering to strengthen capabilities at EW ranges, like the uh, range, the electronic proving ground at Fort Huachuca in Arizona. And this training and a new Western Range complex demo that I proposed, it's going to benefit all the services. I'm pretty sure of that. So, General, how do you intend to approach preparing the Air Force and all the services for the EW fight? 
Senator, thank you very much uh, for that for that question. Uh, I, I agree with your assessment when when you mention your experience in Desert Storm. I think one would look and and maybe be a bit disappointed in the progress between Desert Storm and maybe the last few years. I think we have really uh, moved out intellectually and now conceptually, and then soon we, now we need to start getting on fielding the capabilities that recognize the point that you made about the centrality uh, of electronic warfare. Uh, associated with that, a, as we look at moving from the types of electronic warfare we, we were familiar with into now thinking about cognitive EW, those sort of things were actually to that next level of better understanding and needing to do it more rapidly and respond, it becomes, it becomes part of the air support superiority mission. It becomes even more uh, central to it. And so therefore having the ability to do test and training on representative systems that we can develop our TTPs on in the live environment or in the virtual environment, I think will be advantageous to our Air Force. Yeah, and uh, at the electronic proving ground, because of the natural geography of the area, uh, uh, representative systems can operate at a much higher power level than they can in, in, in other places. Um, of note here, we're gonna get the first compass call airplane here pretty soon in Arizona, the EC-37B, the new EW plane for the Air Force. Uh, we were able to add four additional airplanes. So that'll give the Air Force about 10. I think in the future we've got to continue to evaluate uh, whether we could need more. Um, and then also, uh, I think of note in my last eight seconds here, you know, airspace to train fourth and now fifth generation fighters is of a premium. And as the stick gets longer, you know, the range gets bigger. And we're going to have to look at stitching some of these ranges together. We're doing that in Arizona. We've got a a demo plan here to connect Barry Goldwater with the Jackal and MOA, uh, Jackal and Outlaw MOAs, um, at least for certain periods of time. We're working with the FAA on that. I'd like to have your support in making this a reality. Uh, Senator, absolutely. Again, as the physical as the physical engagements in an actual combat get bigger, we need to understand how to better replicate that, even if not all the time, but to work with the FAA to make sure we have the ability to do that. I, and I certainly look forward to working with you in the future if I'm confirmed. Th thank you, General. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Uh, Senator Sullivan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, good to see you again. Congratulations to you and your family. Thank you for your family service. Um, real quick on a whole host of issues, but just following up from Senator Kelly's, you, you have to stitch together things in the lower 48, but talk about J Park and how important J Park is going to be for the future of the Air Force, future of the Navy, future for American aviation, airspace bigger than Florida. Um, and expanding, right? We can expand it there. The only people get a little upset are some of our moose hunters in the fall, and we can take care, cooperate with them. But talk about the importance of J Park and how that's a premier range for training. Well, Senator, you, you basically said it very well. It is a premier range, and it's one of those where we are committed to uh, increasing the sophistication and the capabilities there because it is as threat representative as one can have, and it also is in an environment with which we can work with allies and partners that are in the neighborhood that can help uh, us to train together uh, in in sort of the, the geog geographical area close to which we may have to fight. Um, you're a student of history. I know uh, the father of the Air Force, Billy Mitchell, referred to one part of uh, America is the most strategic place, not just for America, but the most strategic place in the world. You know what he was talking about when he said that? I believe that's when he was carrying mail as well up in Alaska. Yeah, he was talking about Alaska. So do you agree with that? He was the father of the Air Force, so I think your answer is very limited in terms of your discretion to say yes or no. Well, with, with my discretion, I would say it is amongst the most important strategic areas in the world. I'm not sure that's exactly what Billy Mitchell says, but I take that as a yes. So um, related to that, we have over 100 fifth gen fighters now in Alaska. There's no place on the planet Earth that has that kind of fifth gen fighter power. But as you and I have ta talked about, on the KC-46, the original basing plan after much uh, study by the Air Force was to put all of the 179 uh, original purchase um, to be based in the lower 48. My own view, having dug into that a lot, I'm not sure how strategic that was. That may have been more budget driven than strategy driven. But now that there's the Air Force is leaning 
towards buying 75 more. Um, can I get your commitment to take a look once again at basing some of those in Alaska, co-located with um, 105th Gen fighters, co-located with Jay Park, which is the best training probably in the world. And as you know, General, if there's a fight in the Indo-PACOM region, even the aircraft in the lower 48, if they're getting over to Asia, are gonna fly directly over Alaska. We have enormous uh, ability to keep the uh, jet fuel at Ileson. Uh, can I get your commitment to look hard at that issue? I know we're looking at the KC-135s, but the KC-46s is, is strategically makes a lot of sense. I just don't understand everything in the lower 48. It doesn't make sense to me. What am I missing? Well, Senator, you have my commitment that as we look at the bridge between the current KC-46 and the KC-135 recapitalization of however many it turns out to be, you have my commitment that we will look at Alaska and evaluate that and, and stay in communication with you as we uh, evolve towards that decision. Great. Thank you on that. Um, there hasn't been a lot of discussion on recruiting. Um, the Air Force is going to miss 10,000 airmen. You know, I think the Army's almost double that. Um, we have an all-volunteer force. If that continues, I mean, we're going we're gonna to really be putting at risk our all-volunteer force. One of the things that I focus on is military recruiting access to high schools. There was an article recently in the Military Times that says, well, pretty much everybody has it. But that wasn't that accurate because a lot of high schools do the bare minimum and say, um, okay, recruiter, you get your one time on campus, one, a year. Tell me what are we doing on recruiting? Uh, is there a problem accessing high schools? Shouldn't be. But what, what do we need to kind of get around this 10,000 person gap? It's a huge issue. It, it, Senator, it is. It is a big issue. I will tell you that uh, which one we are laser focused on. What I can give you is the progress between last year and this year, and then I'll offer a couple uh, thoughts very quickly. We, uh, it, it, the total force, the National Guard this year is looking to be 30% uh, more recruiting this year than last year. The reserves 20% more than this year than last year. You mean better? more recruits this year than last year. The challenge is when you always recruit to end strength is that if you're, if you're 4,000 short one year, then you got 8,000 the next year, and then you got 12,000. So the, the idea of, of, of looking what you recruit against. So I look at how many they recruited last year and how many they recruited this year. And by we got three weeks, two weeks left in the year, and it looks like the Air National Guard will increase by 30% this year what they did last year, and the reserves by 20%. The Air Force had to dig deep into our bench, that uh, delayed entry program. We are refilling that bench. Uh, what it looked like we were gonna be in February or March was gonna be 6,000 short in the active duty. Now it looks like we're gonna be closer to 2,900. All that to say, we are starting to look at these programs where we are reevaluating our policies without sacrificing standards. We are looking at some of the more incentives that we're enabling more folks to come in here. But to your point, Senator, specifically about outreach, we need to be more active about getting into the high schools uh, consistently. Uh, I think we hopefully we're at the end of the real post-COVID not being able to get into schools. That, that two or three year period is I think we're, we're done with that to be able to think about that as a cost. So our getting back into those high schools and fundamentally meeting these prospective airmen where they are and reaching out to them digitally, I think, and we are looking at re increasing the number of recruiters to be able to do that. And if I'm confirmed, it will remain, I've been ahead of a task force to help move some of these forward, and it will remain a focus of mine if I'm, if I'm uh, confirmed. Great, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I, I know there's been discussion on this. I just wanna make one comment. Uh, nobody's working as hard I mean, as you and I and others on, on this issue yeah. of getting our flag officers confirmed, trying to find compromise. I do think there is certainly a role with the majority leader to start bringing some of the members of the Joint Chiefs to the floor for votes. That's what we've done for many years and to deny that that's a part of the responsibility. We've been confirming all kinds of lower ranking people. I think uh, the majority leader needs to get involved in this as well, but I'm gonna continue to work with you, Mr. Chairman, on this issue. I know it's very important to our flag officers and I care deeply about it, but there's a role for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, Senator Blumenthal, please. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here, General. Thanks for your candor in our meeting the other day. Uh, and 
today as well. Um, I want to congratulate you and thank you and your family, Gina, and your three children. Uh, I know you can't do what you do without their support, um, and they serve as well as you. You and I talked the other day about training Ukrainian pilots. I know you talked a little bit today about the F-16s and how important they are to the Ukrainians' fight against Russia's murderous aggression uh, and atrocities, war crimes uh, there. And uh, I have visited Ukraine four times in the last 18 months. I've advocated that we provide F-16s probably for the past year. Um, you and I discussed a little bit the length of time required for training, the need to learn English, at least enough English to be able to be trained. And I wonder if you could tell me again, assuming that those Ukrainians have that language understanding, the linguist linguistic ability, uh, and uh, how long it would take to train uh, Ukrainians at uh, Morris Air National Guard Base in Arizona, where I understand that training is going to begin in this country. Well, Senator, thank you for that question. And, and uh, I really have been throughout this hearing. We've talked to Ukraine a little bit, but I haven't said um, how proud I think we all are of Ukraine for what they've done and their bravery. And so uh, in, in our support, uh, integrating with our European allies and partners in the training, we did talk in your office about how long it takes to train. Once they uh, have sufficient English proficiency, obviously every student is different at, at uh, their level of proficiency and advancing through the course, but the course that we're putting them through usually takes approximately six months. So if they were to start here next uh, month or so, it would be early into the spring. Uh, following that though, there that's just your basic F-16 training. There are some specificities about the, the actual platforms that are being donated from the, the Danes and the Dutch and others that, that have uh, specific peculiarities to them. So there'll be some some small follow-on, but with respect to just learning the F-16 and then the follow-on, I would imagine that's somewhere between uh, six and nine months. I realize that uh, different uh, weapons platforms require different amounts of training. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the privilege of visiting our base in Germany, just outside Munich, right. Cotton Rear. Uh, and I think I observed to you that the training on Bradley and Stryker vehicles there is taking significantly less time than was projected and normally would be required. And in fact, uh, I will just add, I'm very proud not only of the Ukrainians and our support for Ukraine, but also of our own military men and women who are providing support now for the Ukrainians in training. They are all in and they're dedication is really uh, impressive. So I'm wondering whether those time periods can be compressed. Uh, Senator, I, I can assure you that um, if the folks in Tucson are, see the advancement, they will not hold them back. They will be proficiency advanced and they, they will train them to the level of their, of their competency. And if that takes less time, that, then all the better. But they will just ensure that they are trained to a certain uh, standard of competency. I want to ask you briefly in the time that I have left, uh, we also discussed the uh, importance of uh, unmanned aircraft, um, the next generation air dominance, family of systems, um, and uh, the role that AI, artificial intelligence, can play. Uh, is that an area of investment where you think we should concentrate? Thank you for that, Senator, because I think that this is one of the areas where I think we need to perhaps move the fastest. Um, I believe that the side that understands how to leverage um, autonomy and do it in an ethical way to where the policymakers feel comfortable putting that type of a, of a capability into combat, I think is going to be key. And so as we're looking at the collaborative combat aircraft, we're focusing on not only just the platform, but separately, we are evaluating the autonomy to understand the left and right limits of what can be done so we can be discussing what should be done earlier on. And then the third thing that we're doing is also this experimental operations unit. So we understand what the platform can do. How do we base it? Where do we base it? How do we integrate it with other elements of our Air Force? Senator, we're just trying to do those all at the same time so we can field that capability responsibly and effectively as soon as possible. And I think that's going to be a key to future combat. 
Uh, finally, let me just say uh, I'm going to enthusiastically support your nomination. I hope we will confirm you as quickly as possible. But uh, to Senator Sullivan's point, confirming just the very top officials of our military leadership will deprive them of the leadership that reports to them. And you can't do your job without a team under you. And you've observed to me how important you think that team is. And uh, I hope we will resolve these issues as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. For the second round, Senator Kramer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General, for hanging in there. Uh, first of all, you've said the words collaborate and dialogue a lot, and I think you mean them. I, I take you at your word. But if after confirmed you actually do that, you will be unusual, just so you know. So we're looking for you to, to, to start a new tradition around here. Now, I followed very closely the, your, the question with um, Senator Fisher, Senator King, Senator Bud regarding the Sentinel. And by the way, thanks for the shout out for the 100-year-old B-52. Incredible. You know it. We all know it in North Dakota. But the Sentinel is equally important to us in modernization. Are, are you committed uh, on behalf of the Air Force to... to to see this thing through to all three bases of, of uh, ICBMs being modernized to completion, realizing that the, the end will be after you and I are both gone probably. But it's really important that we're committed to this all the way through. Senator, I'm absolutely committed. And, and if for no other reason, then um, it's required. Yeah, the, 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 the idea that we now have uh, a, another country who is fielding nuclear capabilities in a very rapid pace, we have, we'll, we'll have an even more complex uh, nuclear deterrence environment. And so uh, to be able to ensure that we have that safe, reliable, and effective uh, in a way that is, is modern is, is absolutely critical. It underpins this nation's defense. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Um, then one last thing, and I'm going to get back to the previous discussion about um, Grand Forks. And thank you for accepting my invitation to come to the UAS Summit as my guest. You're, you're one of two that will be there. As you know, General Saltzman is joining us as well. I want to take full advantage of all the jet fuel that's going to be used to get you, both of you there. And um, I want to show you every, every corner of that base. I know you, you served there, you commanded, but um, what's going on on the private side, on the civilian side, is nothing short of remarkable. What General Atomics is doing, training our pilots, and, and our allies' pilots with Northrop Grumman, their operations incredible. Obviously, TRMC's um, use of the, the RQ-4s, um, it, it's remarkable stuff. I want you to see that innovative ecosystem that's been created and that's enhanced, frankly, by the University of North Dakota. Just last week, I was there to celebrate the very first um, National Security uh, Fellowship at the, at the School of Engineering. Um, We've created that ecosystem that even the, that even the FAA recognizes and allows us, and, and our, our radar system that allows us to test beyond visual uh, sight. And, and so I, I want to do that, but I, I, you, you might have to stay more than a couple hours. That's my only point. I just I, I want to take full advantage of you and General Saltzman together and have these very serious conversations about the future. Uh, Senator, I commit to that. Uh, because I, I do look forward to that. And when you say the words innovation in the ecosystem, that sort of gets my blood going as well, because I think that's part and parcel to our future is leveraging all the innovation is out there um, in all parts. Well, then I might have to do a round table with a bunch of smart deans and, and um, students as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Kramer. Thank you very much, General. Uh, I look forward to uh, Seeing your rapid confirmation, I think you and Secretary Kendall will make a superb team. And I commend you for your service to the nation and just as importantly, your family service to the nation. You've made us all very proud. Thank you. With that, I would adjourn this. Yes, sir.